is Blake on religion. William Blake was born in England in 1757 and died there 70 years later, in 1827. Blake never went to school and yet today anyone familiar with the English language if asked to make a list of the six greatest users of the town could not, if he's familiar with the language, he could not omit the name of Blake in any list of six. I asked that question of Aldous Huxley about five or six years ago. And he said to me, just what I've just said to you, that no one familiar with English literature, all the way back to Chaucer, Chaucer, Spencer, Milton, Shakespeare, you might alter the list somewhat, but he said no one could omit the name of Blake in any list of six of the greatest users of the English town. And he never saw the inside of a school. He taught himself Hebrew, Greek, Italian, and of course he was the master of the English town. He had his visions from the time he was a child, and when he died, he was still communing with the world of eternity, really. He was singing hymns and he said, they're not mine. They belong to those in eternity. They're not really mine. He said of religion, I know of no other Christianity and of no other gospel other than the liberty both of body and mind to exercise the divine arts of imagination. Imagination, the real and eternal world, of which this vegetable universe is but a faint shadow, and into which we shall go in our eternal or imaginative bodies when these vegetable mortal bodies are no more. There is no one who has given more to this world concerning the secret of imagining than Blake, unless, of course, we speak of the Bible. For the Bible to him was pure vision from beginning to end. It was his textbook. And so he asked this very prominent man of the day, why is it that the Bible is more entertaining and instructive than any other book? And then he answered the man, is it not because it is addressed to the imagination which is spiritual sensation and only immediately to the understanding or reason? So to him the book was pure revelation, God's word. He wrote what he considered the grandest poem in the world, Jerusalem. He said, I may praise it because I am only the secretary. Its authors are in eternity. Here, in a very short period of time, Blake completed this grand poem. He said it was dictated to me, sometimes twelve, sometimes twenty, and thirty verses, not verses, but lines at a time. So here a work that should have taken a lifetime of labor came without labor in so short a period of time. And he starts in the beginning and he states the theme before he allows the dictation. And the theme is stated in the very first two lines. Of the sleep of Alva, Alva is this world, and of the passage through eternal death and of the awakening to eternal life. Then said he, this theme calls me night after night in sleep, and every morn awakes me at sunrise, then I see the spirit of my Savior hovering over me and dictating the words of this mild song. The spirit of love, his Savior, hovering and dictating twelve, twenty, thirty lines at a time. And then the dictation begins with an appeal to man. Awake, awake, O sleeper, 
of the land of shadows. Wake, expand, I am in you, and you in me, mutual in love divine. But then said he, the perturbed man, a way turns down the valley's dark. He can't believe it. A man imputes sin and righteousness to individuals and not to states. To understand Blake, you've got to draw a line of demarcation between the individual, the immortal you, and the state, the present state of that individual. He said, as the problem passes, while the country permanent remains, so men pass on, but states remain permanent forever. So we must distinguish between the state and the individual occupying that state to understand Blake. He said, all that you behold, though it appears without, it is within, in your imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. And he constantly reminds the reader never to condemn any one of this world. For, said he, I do not consider the just or the wicked to be in a supreme state, but to be states of the sleep which the soul may fall into in its deadly dreams of good and evil. So come, Lord Jesus, said he, and create states to deliver man evermore. So you see someone who is not feeling well, maybe he's up against it financially, maybe things aren't going as they ought to go, that's a state. If you know the difference between the individual in that state and a former state or a future state that you can create, you can lift him out of it by representing that individual to yourself as you would like to see him and put him in that state. Do it without his knowledge, do it without his consent. You can do it. You can create a state and pull people out of horrible states into lovely states. Lead them into lovely state and they will simply occupy it beautifully and today it will be the only state, the only real thing is what they're in at the moment when you pull them into it. And he shows us how to do it. He said, I have fourfold vision seen and a fourfold vision is given to me. It is fourfold in my supreme delight and threefold in soft, viewless night. His twofold always may God us keep from single vision and Newton's sleep. Single vision to him was simply the ordinary physical sight, but this is what appears to be and nothing more. Double vision is when everything is but a symbol. I told you the story the morning I opened of the little girl five years old. Well, her little sister, who was three this past year, taken to the beach by her grandmother. In the beach, or out on the sea, were piles driven into the sand, marking some bunker. And she turns to the grandmother and she said, Grandma, look, sticks bathing. Well, it struck the mother family, the grandmother, and she recorded it and told me about it. But this little child, not yet painted with the adult mind, saw sticks bathing. They were not simply piles in the sand, unsightly, not to her. She rejoiced and wished at the moment she were a stick, and out in that water, bathing with the sticks, because to them, or to the little mind, she endowed the sticks with animation, with something alive, and they were bathing. That's double vision. And he speaks of it to my outward eye, it's an old, it is simply a pebble, or a thistle along the way. But with my inward eye, it's an old man gray. He looked at a flower, he saw a flower with the outer eye, and with the inner eye, he saw something entirely different. Don't you practice that? You look at something along the way, and you see it entirely differently. He said, I went to the heath in the wild, to the thorns and the thistles of the way. And they told me how they were beguiled, driven out, and then compa compelled to be chased, as he called it. Here things were, to the outward eye, a thistle and a thorn. And he communed with the thistle and the thorn. And they spoke to him and told him that they were simply the embodiment of the suppressed longings of the normal longings of the human heart. He communed with them and they spoke to him. 
All this was double vision. Now, threefold vision, you must practice. Practice it tonight. Everyone must or should practice it. What the little girl did, that's threefold vision. She imagine herself in a living room with all glass walls. That's an image. The room is an image. And she is an image. The mother is an image. And all that she did, she blended and intermingled images. She married them. And then they produced offspring. The offspring was the result in the world where the home was bought by her father. She did not consult the father. She simply took her mother into her confidence and together they played the part. And then the father had a change of jobs, increased income, and he bought the home. So that is threefold vision. If I bring you into my mind's eye and represent you to myself as I would like to see you and persuade myself of the reality of this imaginal act of mine, that's threefold vision. What does it imply? Well, it implies good fortune for you. So I'm doing something which would imply something else. That which is implying is the offspring of my image. I bring you, put an expression on your face, I listen to words coming from you where you tell me how well things are going for you. All this imagery, I intermingle and blend it and marry it and then it produces the result I am looking for. The result is the offspring of this blending of images. That's threefold vision. Fourfold vision, whether you've had it or not, I do not know. I will share with you an experience. I've had it time and again. But here is one. I think I've told you this before, but it lends itself to this vision, and so I want to share it with you. Many years ago in Beverly Hills, four in the morning, I'm on my right side, and I know that what I am seeing, I should not see. But with my eyes open, I should see a little tiny bureau and a picture on it, and on the wall above it, just a small little picture. But I should not see what I'm seeing. I am seeing the interior of a very lush and plush hotel. I am seeing it as vividly and more so than I'm seeing you now. And yet, yet I know where I am. I'm on my bed. It's in Beverly Hills, on El Camino. I'm on my right side. I can feel all this. And I should not be seeing what I'm seeing. But I am seeing it, and I can't deny it. So, consciousness follows vision. And I, I walk in to my image. And the image is just as real as this room. I remembered where the body was. So I returned to the body. Returning to the body, I'm once more in a horizontal position. Consciousness again follows vision, and I am now in a vertical position. I step right into this interior. I came back and went forward, back and forth, about a dozen times. Then I said to myself, I am going to venture. Regardless of the consequences, I am going to venture. With that decision made, I stepped into the interior, and then it closed around me. I am actually the occupant of the image. And the room is just as solid as this room. But I am shut out. There is no way back to Beverly Hills and Earth and that body on the bed. Here I am in an entirely different world, but the world is solid. I touch the bureau and it's solid. I touch the walls and they're solid. Then I thought, well now I'll explore. I'm here for this purpose. So I came out of this room as it closed around me. And I came into a large passageway, which lay down to another hallway. I walked to the end. And then as I got there, it was quite well lit, and I saw two ladies walking by. And as they started by, I spoke to them, and I said, ladies, this is a dream, you know. And they were afraid, as any lady would be afraid if a total stranger met them in a public hallway and told them that this is a dream, I know you would be afraid. And so they either thought they were in the presence of a mad person or something, but they were startled. But that world was so solid, they couldn't go through the wall. They wished they could, but they couldn't. It's a real world. Then I looked up, and I noticed over my head a peculiar ornament. I had seen a similar one in North Hollywood in her friend's home. At the time I asked him, how does this thing remain up? And he said to me, if you look closely, you will notice an almost, but not quite, an almost invisible thread and is anchored to the ceiling by that almost invisible thread. It gives the illusion of floating. It was a copper thing, very lightly done, beautiful leaves, but a very large picture. 
And so I thought, well, now this is only a memory image of what I saw in Hollywood. So this I know is gossamer. So I put my hand on it, and I say to the ladies, I'll show you ladies, and I really thought that when I touched it, it would disappear. As I held it, it was solidly real, just like this. I then said to myself, now Neville, you know exactly how this thing happened. Your body is in Beverly Hills on a bed. Your wife is in that bed. It's a double bed. That house is on El Camino, and that's in the state of California, and California is in America. This is a dream. You know it's a dream. You know exactly how the whole thing started. You saw, while on the bay, what you should not have seen, and you ventured, you stepped into your image, and the image became real, as real as it is now to you. So wake up. And I said to myself, come on, wake up. And I actually felt myself waking, as it were, coming to you. And I'm waking, fully awake, and I'm standing in that hallway. And no possibility of return. There's no road back. I say to myself, now you know this is stupid. You have unfinished business on her. You have a child not yet educated. She's in high school, and she has the ambition and the talent to go to college. And so, it is unfinished business. When you, tomorrow morning your wife will wake, and the body will be dead. You'll have to perform an autopsy because you weren't ill. And they're going to bring in some kind of a verdict, but whatever the verdict is, you're dead. And here you are, fully alive, in an entirely different world. So standing there, I shut my eyes, and, as would happen to anyone else, I couldn't see anything with my lids closed. I opened my lids, and here I'm still in this room, this hallway. I did it several times, and then I decided to try something that once before succeeded in bringing me back, and that was the sense of touch. That's why I know beyond all doubt that Blake was quite right when he said, imagination is spiritual sensation. So standing vertically, I assumed that my head was on a pillow. I simply assumed it, and imagined the sensation that I would feel were it true, and I could feel a pillow. And strangely enough, on feeling a pillow, I had the sensation of being now on a horizontal uh, level, not vertical. And then I could feel the pillow, and I said to myself, well, at least I'm back, but I'm cataleptic. I could not move my body. I couldn't move any part of it. In about, say, 20 seconds, I could, with tremendous effort, move this little thing on my left hand. A little while later, I could move it from the elbow. As I got that motion, I pushed it out, and I felt to my wife's body. I knew then I was back, but I couldn't open my lids. My eyes were actually sealed. Then maybe another 15, 25 seconds, with tremendous effort, I got the eye open, and here are the familiar objects on the wall. The little picture on the bureau, the bureau, and I'm back. Then I could begin to really move it, and then return to normalcy. That's fourfold vision. When you're seated in a chair, and you see what you shouldn't see. Not the familiar objects, but something entirely different. When you venture now, and step into your image, that's what he meant. If the spectator could enter into these images in his imagination, approaching them on the fiery chariot of his contemplative thought. If he could make a friend and a companion of any one of these images of wonder, then he would rise from the grave. Then he would meet the Lord in the air, and then he would be happy. That's stepping into the image, and the image takes on all the qualities of reality, just as real as this room has. And you know beyond all doubt, that nothing dies. You actually see it, that nothing passes away, that the world does not come to an end where my senses cease to register it. It, it continues, everything continues. And then he brought out even a little sigh, a tear, a smile, a hair. Yes, even the grain of dust passes not away. Nothing passes away. But he saw the world entirely differently from the world that appears to us. I saw that world on several occasions. I've told it and shared it with you too. He said eternity exists, and all things in eternity, independent of creation, which was an act of mercy. You know what he means? Everything from the cradle to the grave that you have and will experience, as though you saw them all in individual little moments, but they aren't animated. They could be seen if you saw them from a higher 
dimension. The entire unfolding picture, not animated. Now, he makes the statement, when weary man enters his cave, he meets his saviour in the grave. Some find a female garment there, and some a male woven with clay, lest the sexual garment sweep should weave a devouring binding sheet. One dies. Alas, the living and the dead. One is slain, and one is slain. So when you enter your cave, he's speaking of the body. And you meet your saviour in the grave. This is the grave. And you actually find there, one finds my mother and my wife and my daughter, they have found female garments. I, my son, my father, we found male garments. But I am not a male, and they aren't female. When we're a man, and he capitalizes man, so man is about the organization of sex. But man entering his grave finds his saviour in the grave. And then he weaves around him a female or a male garment. But he is neither female nor male. He's man. And man is above the organization of sex. So here, as we enter, we are seen. And then he said, you do not see what I see. And then he tells us what he sees in the furnaces. And then he tells us, Luba was cast into the furnaces of affliction and sealed. Well, Luba to him is love. And love is Jesus Christ. Love is God. Infinite love. You meet him right in the cave when you enter, and there you find your Savior in the grave. He said he was cast in to this grave and sealed, and he calls it furnaces of affliction. But he tells us it is for a purpose, and the purpose is to bring perfection to the individual sealed with his Savior while in the grave. And he paints it so vividly, these states through which you and I must pass, and pass as a purple. The states remain permanent, but we pass on, because we are moving from state to state to state. So here, in this poor, poor vision, and may you have it tonight, it's the thrill of thrills, a little disturbing, when you have unfinished business, I assure you. But I didn't want, at that moment, to leave behind a wife, unprotected, a daughter, uneducated. Yes, I could leave a little poor, but I didn't feel, as a husband who loves her, that it was equal to what I wanted to give her. And so I had unfinished business. And yet there was no way back. I'm an entirely different world. And the world is just as real as this. And I knew, reason told me, the body had to be discovered the next day. My body that I'm wearing seemingly is solid. But here is a body. I knew I left the body in Beverly Hills. And so I, walked, I went back through feeling. I simply sensed the film. And so when he made the statement in his letter to Dr. Trusner, is it not spiritual sensation? Is not the Bible addressed to that in man, which is all imagination? Well, I felt it, because years before that, I too stepped into an image. I became awake in the image. As Thoreau said, real living is to be in a dream awake. When one is in a dream, awake. Well, this is a dream, and then you wake in the dream, and the dream ceases to be a dream. It's just like this. If what I did was a dream, this here is just as much a dream, I shall assure you. For that image simply became just like this room. But once before, I found myself in an image. And some object in that experience scared me. And I knew exactly how to get back to the sense of touch. And I tried a thing and it worked. If I find myself dreaming now and I know I'm dreaming, I may prolong the dream or wake in the dream through the sense of touch. And I find if I hold an out that is not movable, I wouldn't hold a cat or a dog or even a person, but I will hold a stationary thing that is seemingly inanimate, like a table, or any inanimate fixed object. And when I hold it, I then say to myself, come on, wait, but don't let go. I will not let go the object, and not letting it go, I wait. I wait in the image, and the object is just as real as I knew it would be, when I awake. So what is dream to us? When you're in the dream itself, it isn't a dream. We speak of a dream when we wake from the dream as subjective. As we reflect upon the experience, we say, well, that was a subjective experience. But it wasn't subjective when you were dreaming. It was very objective to you, the dreamer. It's only subjective after 
the experience. Well, that's what he means by fourfold vision. He didn't always have it. He confessed that. He said, now I have fourfold vision, see. And a fourfold vision is given to me. It is fourfold in my supreme delight. And it is. For when you can sit quietly in a chair and leave behind you all the things of that day and step right into an entirely different world. And the world is just like this, real, and people. It's a sheer delight. Threefold vision is what you and I call upon to practice to bring about changes of stage for those we love. So you meet a person and things aren't going well, all right? It doesn't really matter. He's only in a state. So you represent him to yourself as other than what he appears to be. Persuade yourself of the reality of that imaginal act. That's another state altogether relative to him. He will conform to it. And you will meet him the next day or the next week, next month, and you will see a change in his behavior. He will conform to this blending of images in your imagination, which union creates whatever the union implies, leading one to the conclusion that causation is simply the assemblage of mental states, which occurring creates that which the assemblage implies. So you assemble images. But what would they imply? Whatever they imply, they're going to create it. So always see to it that it's going to create something lovely. For the images, when blending, if they are occurring, invariably creates what they are in implying. Anyone can do it. And you're invited to try it. That's what Blake taught. And from the time that he could breathe, he was teaching those that he met the difference between the individual and states. And begging man not to impute sin and righteousness to the individual, but to the state. He gets out of the state and he leaves behind him all that that state radiated. When he's in a state, it seems to be the only reality. When you're not in a state, it seems shadowy. A mere possibility. But not when you're in it. When you step into an image, and that image closes around you, it's real. I mean, all together, just like this room here now. And you can train yourself to step into these images and prove the being that you really are. You're not confined to the little body of five senses at all. You are a man of all imagination. So when you say what seems to be is to those to whom it seems to be and is productive are the most grateful consequences to those to whom it seems to be, even of despair and eternal death. But, said he, divine mercy steps beyond and redeems man in the body of Jesus. And so he steps right beyond and redeems us. We can go from state to state to state, but we cannot save ourselves. Salvation is initiated by God. It is not given to us for any good deeds done, I assure you. On the other hand, it is not given as due reward for merit, that I assure you. It is bestowed by grace alone, and then we are told in the scripture why. In virtue of his own mercy. Not because of anything I did. Not because of anything you did. When you are salvaged from this world of states, the furnaces of affliction, bear in mind you didn't earn it. Not one being in the world can earn his own salvation. But it's going to be given to him by the mercy of God. And it's called in the scripture grace. Pure grace. Unearned. No one can earn it. And Blake saw it so clearly. And told us all, in spite of all these states, glorious states, you could be pure in your own mind's eye. You could be impure in the eyes of others. But whether you were just or wicked, it was not to him anything that you could brag about. Because there were only states. You fell into a state and found yourself in a pure state and taught yourself so pure. The state was. And you, the occupant, activated it. You animated it. And it became real to you and maybe you liked it and remained in that state. But you could easily have fallen into another state, a wicked state. And when you are in a state, you partake of the nature of that state. And you animate it and make it all alive. But you are neither wicked nor pure. You are just this immortal being Putting through, putting through the furnaces of affliction. And you pass through all these furnaces for a divine reason. To be made perfect as he is perfect. And when in his eye you are perfect, it brings you out of it. Divine mercy steps beyond and redeems man in the body of Jesus. And so all will be redeemed because you can't earn it. And Blake made it so clear. If you haven't read Jerusalem, what a thrill, what a treat in store for you. 
There are only a hundred plates, and a plate doesn't even run, a full page. And so, you can really read it in an hour. Easily. Some words may be a little bit difficult to grasp, because he does involve it by calling a certain attribute loss. Well, loss is imagination. That divine being that remains faithful to vision in the time of trouble. If you turn it back, it's the sun. It really is the soul or the animating principle of everything in this world. And so when you see through his eyes, you will have to experience, I have met me. We are separated in time, but we are two figures closely woven in this tapestry of life. I met him just about a year ago. And he showed me exactly how to fall in order to see what he described so beautifully in Jerusalem. I stood perfectly still. He said, let yourself go backwards. And so I threw myself backwards like a back down. And I came whirling through interstellar space as though I were a meteor. And when I, the motion was arrested and I stood still, here I'm looking at the most wonderful being. And he seen as I looked at him, one being. As I came close, multitudes of nations are in that being. All races, all nations. As I look closer, their heart is like glowing ruby. But it too is made up of numberless races and nations. I look still closer, and the whole body, containing all races, I'm looking at myself. Here the face is my face, and yet in that one being, all the races, all the nations are contained. I'm looking right into my own face, and my heart is glowing like ruby, but it contains all men, all women. All these bodies are in it. And it was Blake who showed me how to fall backwards in order to see the vision. And so I, I tumble backwards, just like some medium whirling itself through space. And when arrested, that's what I saw. So although we were parted in time, he died in 1827, and I was born in 1905, so our pairs never met on earth, but in the spirit they certainly meet. And so his visions are my visions. When he said eternity exists, 